So book this uh, for another. Can you uh, hear me? Two days, <laughs> two more days. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Can yeah, you sure. hear me? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Now uh, making moves. Can you hear me? Next thing is also ready. Fine. Rest everything. George. Ah, yes. Yes, thank you. Ah, yeah, fine. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So, anyway, sir, this is also uninterruptedly will go on. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, hi. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. We can understand, but uh, suddenly after logging in yesterday, we faced this issue. No? So, uh, uh, that's okay. Yes, yes. Uh, and that too from IAC and ISS, uh, we cannot, uh, at least from any of our friends or something, we can do something else, yes, but uh, not easy. Uh, so, yeah, okay. Okay, fine. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, we tell The same huh? way. Same thing we do for another two days. Okay, so. Go host and host and
good afternoon professor mahesh haryaram good afternoon ash how are you good how are you doing fine uh, do you want to check the ppt yes uh, you made him co host yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Just a second. We'll make yourself co-host. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I have made you a co-host, and uh, you can uh, share the slides. Yes, it's visible. <laughs> So we have seven minutes left. We'll start exactly at two o'clock.
Good afternoon, all. Welcome to the second session of third day of FCP. This session will be taken by Professor Mahesh Hariharan, Professor and Head, School of Chemistry, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Trivandrum. He's an emerging scientist in photochemistry and ultrafast spectroscopy. In this session, Professor Hariharan will be talking on Greek, Greek cross plus aggregate, a paradigm for excitation isolation. To introduce Professor Hari Haran, I invite Dr. Harish S., Department of Chemistry Biochemistry, MS Ramaya College of Art, Science and Commerce. So good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Harish S., Assistant Professor, uh, Department of Chemistry Biochemistry, uh, MS Ramaya College of Art, Science and Commerce. I welcome you all for the third day, sixth session of Friday faculty development, uh, development program on spectroscopic technique, a tool in contemporary research organized by the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. I'm honored to introduce our guest for the current session. Today we have an eminent speaker and experienced scientist, Professor Mahesh Aryaran, as a professor at School of Chemistry, ISA Tiruvananthapuram. After completing doctoral research from CSIR NIST, NI, NIST India with Dr. D. Ramaya, Dr. Hariyaran carried out postdoctoral research with Professor F. T. Levis at Northwestern University. His research efforts focus on understanding the interaction of light with biomolecules, crystalline and twisted organic materials. Professor Hariyaran is the recipient of bronze medal from the Chemical Research Society of India in 2020, Japanese Photochemistry Association Lectureship Award for Asian and Oceanian Photochemists sponsored by Ecosha in 2020, Distinguished Lectureship Award from the Chemical Society of Japan in 2017, and the Asian and Oceanian Photochemistry Association Young Scientist Prize in 2014. Professor Hariyaran has featured in the Young Scientist issue in ChemCom 2017, Chemistry a European Journal in 2018, and Journal of Physical Chemistry in 2019. We are honored to have you with us and extend my sincere thanks for having accepted, accepted our inv invitation, sir. We are eagerly waiting to hear your talk on Greek cross aggregate, a paradigm for exciton isolation. A flat, the platform is open uh, to you, sir, or to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harish, uh, for kind words of introduction. Um, thanks to Dr. Ashley uh, for the invitation to deliver a lecture during this particular uh, refresher course series that is being arranged. And I see that the, each of the uh, techniques are quite unique in its own respect, that it's worth understanding the basics and also advancements in the topic. So today, uh, uh, what I felt is that I'll give a brief idea on what is Greek cross aggregate, a paradigm for exciton isolation. Uh, but then I will go slowly from the basics that we have studied in the area of fast photography, and then a glimpse through molecular spectroscopy to reach a point where we understand what is either called ultrafast spectroscopy or femtosecond spectroscopy, and then come to a molecular system where we have contributed something which is called Greek cross aggregate. So that is the overall plan of the talk. So initial 22, uh, 22 minutes, it will be fast photography, and then we move on to femtosecond spectroscopy, and then the last part will have the um, exciton isolation. Now you see here in the first slide, there are quite large number of topics uh, that are being narrated in three distinct diagrams. Uh, one is water molecule in its dynamic state upon photo excitation, meaning that you give energy to water molecule, what happens in the excited state. And the, this is called excited state dynamics of any given molecule, let us say water or any other molecule is still an interesting topic by itself. Now, another thing that you see over here is something that is not 
uh, uh, finding from uh, our lab, but then it is from uh, elsewhere in the world. And I will show you a video on how we can see uh, the uh, uh, electronic movement in a given atom using so-called attosecond spectroscopy, which is an emerging topic. So uh, first I'll show you what it is, and then we will go forward to understand a little bit of that. And the third diagram, as you see over here, uh, clearly talks about an organic molecule that you see, uh, which is upon excitation, undergoes uh, a photo decomposition. And this photo decomposition has been mapped using laser pulses. And that is what the technique that you see, uh, which is called femtosecond spectroscopy. So these are the major three themes of uh, today's discussions. Um, now, this is the department that I, I come from, and uh, it's in the middle of a very green uh, uh, area. And the campus is, is quite a lot of, uh, you know, uh, green environment that we have. And this is an aerial view of School of Chemistry uh, at Aisa Tiruvanandaguram. It's in the foothills of Punmudi, which is, uh, again, a quite touristic place, if you ever visit um, at Trivandrum. Now, this is what happens if you photo excite Aisa Tiruvanandaburam. In the night, it looks like, you know, truly illuminated with a very beautiful sky that you see around. So if you ever happen to be in Trivandrum, please visit and, uh, um, and see our campus. Um, as I said, uh, in today's discussion, it will be a, a quite a lot of combination of uh, organic chemistry, uh, physical chemistry and little bit of biophysical chemistry um, and for which this perhaps is the only slide that will have uh, a very basic question uh, which is from the organic chemistry and has been long studied uh, yet it took about 100 years for scientists to understand uh, the mechanistic aspects of these molecules and that is why fast photography and uh, ultrafast spectroscopy are essential in order to understand this. Um, probably in one hour, like we will not get the uh, understanding that easily about the entire process. So I have I have divided the talk in such a way that the initial part goes into real uh, simple descriptors of how the spectroscopic techniques work. And then like you move on to establish them in the context of some understanding that we are interested in organic chemistry and various other topics. So this particular reaction, which is combination of two ethylenes to give cyclobutane has been studied for quite a long time. And uh, many of you would know that using the descriptors of Woodward and Hoffman, this has been identified as concerted mechanism, which means that you shine light and you directly hit the product without having any intermediates. And this was the conventional understanding uh, for quite a long time. However, there were scientists who really wanted to explore whether there are intermediates present in this molecule. So you can just uh, imagine that if, if the intermediates existed, then it would be called as non-concerted mechanism or uh, alternatively, they can be called a stepwise mechanism. So how that will look like? Let us assume uh, that we have uh, light falling onto ethylene molecule and therefore uh, the pi bond ruptures because of the uh, light incidence and will have a di radical generated because of the homolytic cleavage uh, of the double bond present in the molecule and thus generated di radical will have the structure that is assigned here. And then two such di radicals that are formed can in principle undergo collision in order to form a new bond between these radicals so that you have a bond that is generated that looks like this. And then move on to have another bond that is generated in order to close this ring in order to create the cyclobutane. Now you can imagine that each of these steps are reversible such that instead of going 
forward, this can also go backward, meaning that, you know, uh, if you create diradical, diradical can recombine back to form a double bond. And then if you have single bond with two radicals formed in a, in a butane-like uh, compound, it can also go back in order to give you this particular intermediate that is shown over here. And then it can cyclize to form cyclobutane, but that can also come back in order to form the product that looks like this. Now, whether a reaction takes a path that is indicated as the concerted mechanism, which means that there is no intermediate formed, or whether the reaction will take the stepwise mechanism where you will have intermediates between them has been long debated. And this has been established about two decades ago in order to uh, 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 come up with uh, an argument that it goes via stepwise mechanism instead of concerted mechanism that you see, which is probably seen in many of the organic chemistry textbooks. So how was this established and what is the relevance of this particular science itself? in order to understand more such processes that are involved, uh, involved in reaction mechanisms. So this is how the potential energy surface looks like. To begin with cyclobutane, you can irradiate uh, with light and then uh, one of the bonds got broken and you have a system that is butane-like with diradical on the terminal carbons. And this is the species that I have indicated over here. And then it can undergo a bond cleavage between here in order to get two ethylene molecules generated. So it is the reversible reaction that is being referred here in terms of the progression from left to right. But if you read it from right to left, you will notice that two ethylene molecules combine together to form cyclobutane. Now, what does this mean? Can we establish that such intermediates can be uh, existent and how do we establish them? Do we have spectroscopic tools to establish that they do exist or do we propose them theoretically that there could be an intermediate that can exist? And these are some of the questions that I'm raising in the beginning and the answers will be given towards the end of this lecture or as we progress along the line. Now you see this is a very beautiful photograph uh, of two um, uh, sportsmen uh, celebrating uh, possibly uh, a fall of wicket uh, and out, right after that, you know, both of them are in action and they are in the air. So uh, often, you know, if you had a camera and if you try taking such photographs, uh, you could notice that, you know, it is hard to take uh, such kind of uh, uh, photograph because if you click this particular event a second ahead of what is happening. Both of these sportsmen would be on the floor. And if you were a bit late uh, in terms of taking the photograph, let's say a second delayed, both of them again would be on the floor after this particular event has happened. So the idea here is to capture the uh, photograph at the right time. And therefore, this area of fast photography got evolved for quite a long time. And then has matured recently, but there is a lot more that one can do about. And this is what literally in terms of spectroscopy, uh, Professor Ahmed Zuvail from Caltech was also working on. And today's talk is based on essentially what has been a contribution from Professor Ahmed Zuvail's group from Caltech in terms of femtosecond spectroscopy. Now, what do you mean by femtosecond spectroscopy? So you can see here that uh, you take a second and divide it by 1,000, you get milliseconds. And you take millisecond divided by 1,000, you get microseconds. And you keep on dividing them with further thousands. You can see that you get nanosecond, picosecond, femtosecond, and attosecond. Now, Femtosecond is of point of interest today, although I'll be describing a little bit of attosecond spectroscopy. Largely, the talk will rely on femtosecond spectroscopy, which is nothing but 10 to the power of minus 15 seconds. So any event that happens in a short period of time, uh, which is of the order of 10 to the power of minus 15 seconds, can be mapped 
using the configuration of a spectrometer, which I am discussing with you today. Now, this is not directly into femtosecond spectroscopy. It's already uh, a sort of well-matured technique over a period of last three decades. Uh, but what is emerging is what is indicated in the cover page here, which is called at a second uh, snapshots reveal dynamics of valence electrons. And this was featured a few years ago, uh, rather in 2017, I believe, uh, in a nature journal. And uh, this was another claim that for the first time ever, laser physicists have recorded an internal atomic event with an accuracy of a trillionth of a billionth of a second, which is 10 to the power of minus 21 seconds. And what do you see here is quite an interesting thing that from a helium atom, an electron is coming out and is the early event that is being uh, imaged using the spectroscopic technique. And this is something about 100 years ago, uh, Albert Einstein would say photoelectric effect, which is nothing but you give electromagnetic radiation to an atom. And if the atom receives the electromagnetic radiation more than the work function that, uh, that an atom requires to push an electron from the system, then the electron would eject out. And this is what we call as photoelectric effect. And to date, we can image them or map them. And that is what the spectroscopy and, uh, and, and the related topics have taken shape. to. So let me show you a video for two minutes, uh, which possibly you would like. And let me start running it and then I'll get back to this particular aspect. Mm. Hope that was something of uh, interest to you. So this video particularly narrates that extremely fast events. Uh, which are of the order of uh, uh, at a second time scales, 
when things are in motion, uh, we can study them using laser pulses, which have the pulsation, pulsating duration of the order of attoseconds. And that's where this topic stands now in the most advanced form. And there are several laboratories outside India that's working on to improve from uh, there as well. But then uh, what I'm going to discuss today is uh, a sort of technique which is one step lower to at a second spectroscopy, which is femtosecond spectroscopy. Uh, it's nothing but uh, it's a form of molecular spectroscopy, but with the time resolution. And time is an important factor here. And I will go slowly in order to narrate like uh, how one can understand that and then how can use them, uh, one can use them in order to understand uh, all sorts of interesting processes. Now, you can see uh, this is something defined uh, in Ahmed Zuel's review article. And uh, here onwards for a few slides, material that I have taken are from uh, Professor Ahmed Zuel's JFISCHEM article. This was published uh, after he got the Nobel Prize. In order to make this topic accessible to uh, scientist in a in a simplified manner. So if you are interested, I will share the article. So here you can see this visual spectroscopy, which is um, uh, described that um, this human eye and its brain interface, human visual system can process about 10 to 12 separate images per second. Now perceiving them individually. So let us take an example that you have uh, radiation of a particular color and the radiation of another color, both of them are falling on our eye, which is what we define as a simple detector. And if those are separated by a time of 100 milliseconds, we will see two events that are registered in our eye. One is like, you know, first color that falls on our eye. And then after 100 milliseconds, the second color falls on our eye. Now, this is quite an interesting aspect that, you know, while uh, we get these two colors uh, registered in our eye one after the other, this is not what happens if two of these events fall pretty much very close to each other in terms of the time. So, let us say that, you know, an order of magnitude uh, time interval is reduced. So, you have about 10 milliseconds. So, these two colors are falling on our eye and we would see that this will be perceived as a combined color of green and yellow. And then the net result is, uh, sorry, green and red. And the net result is that we will perceive them as yellow. This is what typically you would notice when the event becomes close to each other, which means that the events start mixing. And then our eye detects them as a mixed event, but although they are occurring in different time scales. Now you see that these two photons that are falling onto our detector separated by 10 milliseconds versus separated by 100 milliseconds makes a huge lot of difference in terms of perceiving them. So many a times when we study things using a detector which is slower, you would notice that we get the uh, information which is uh, mixed information in terms of the dynamics. Now, this is what we typically miss out if we are going by fast detectors uh, and not the slower ones. So, one such case is you see that hummingbird that has got about 70 hertz as the uh, wing movement speed. And if you use a normal camera, you would notice that, you know, the, the wings are not clear for us. They will be like, you know, fuzzy image that is being created. Now, if you take a, a sort of magic circle or like, you know, you go to one of these uh, sports places uh, for kids, you would find uh, an entertaining um, uh, uh, thing that looks like this. And you take the photograph of it. It has about 30 hertz uh, as the uh, frequency. And uh, you would notice that you get a blurred image with the camera that we often use. Now, this is leopard moving and you can see the movement speed of its feet is of the order of 15 hertz and therefore you notice that the uh, feet gets a little bit fussier in the photograph and the fourth one 
is the photograph of Usain Bolt finishing uh, his 100 meter dash. And you could notice that his legs are like one leg is fussier and the other one not much moving and therefore it is uh, visible. And that's of the order of 12 hertz in terms of the uh, frequency at which uh, the legs move. Now, all these point to the fact that as you move from 70 hertz to 12 hertz, the camera, the normal camera that we use tends to become useful in order to capture the static image. But at the same time, anything which is faster in terms of its movement, the camera becomes obsolete in order to study. That. But if we need to get information regarding such kind of wing movement and related aspects, how do we go about it? And scientists have work, worked on this uh, kind of aspects. And this is the picture of a hummingbird using standard uh, 1 by 60 seconds exposure. So it will be sort of, you know, very short exposure that you get. The flap of wing occurred several times during the exposure time and the wing is blurred in the picture. This is what typically we, we see. But then you wish to have a photograph that looks like this in order to have the hummingbird uh, sucking nectar from a flower. And you have uh, the wing in a particular orientation, in another orientation and the third orientation. And all of them are nicely captured uh, in the images. And here the trick is to have hummingbird flight recorded using fast exposure. Every frame shows a clear view of hummingbird, hummingbird wing. And you see the precision with which the, uh, the, the exposure is being controlled is 1 divided by 1000 seconds, which is of the order of 1 milliseconds. So you move from 1 60th of a second to 1 1000th of a second. You start capturing such event and you can get them very clearly mapped uh, using photographs. Now you imagine a situation that you have water molecules which are extremely dynamic uh, and you are using a camera which cannot get information about the dynamic event, event that is going on in water. But then if you have used improved camera in order to have water molecules orientation in distinct direction, that's what precisely we are talking about. So not just orientation, any event that happens in the time scales of one divided by 1000 seconds can be captured using this particular camera. But then while the camera development was going on in milliseconds and microseconds, etc., what was really interesting in spectroscopy is that it was going in a direction which is of the order of nanoseconds, picoseconds and femtoseconds. And this is the journey that I am going to talk to you today, which long ago, scientists have started and arrived uh, in, a, in a matured science which we are dealing in terms of understanding reaction intermediates and kinetics of the kinetics of the reaction, extremely fast reaction. Let me play another simple video and uh, this is something that I have lifted from YouTube. It's not made by me. All of you know what is uh, photography, the typical photography of older generation is nothing but you take silver chloride and put them in a in a gel type material and we call them as negatives or films etc and shine light on it you will create uh, silver and chlorine because of the bond breakage between silver and chlorine and this bond breakage would result in silver which has got a different color when compared to silver chloride and this has been efficiently used in order to get the photographs generated of the objects that we were interested in. So let us see first the simple chemistry that goes on and then we will come back to the uh, point a little later. So, oops, I'm unable to play this video for some technical reasons, but you can uh, type this particular keyword in YouTube and you can find yourself. So the trick is the following that you, Keep a key and then shine light and wherever light falls, uh, you can see that silver chloride gets converted into silver and that is what you see here. And wherever it was silver chloride, it remains silver chloride. And once you do the exposure of light, you remove the key, you get the nice pattern of the key that is being imaged on a surface here. 
and this is how the photography got uh, matured in order to do it in a better way although uh, this was not the case quite long ago and therefore uh, several people including uh, professor ahmed zuwain started working on something which is fast photography or fast spectroscopy and the, these are the books that narrates very nicely about the progress of this particular topic and the birth of molecules is something that is quite an exciting read if you just type in the internet you will get this particular article uh, vk jain has written uh, about the finding of ahmed zuwain as the world's fastest camera uh, although in another 26 years by now in we are in 2022 the world is world's fastest camera is keep on improving to get better and uh, ahmed zuwail has written two volumes of books on ultra fast dynamics of the chemical bond if you are interested in our understanding about chemical bond also has uh, uh, improved a lot in the last several years in terms of the ultra fast spectroscopy uh, that is implemented in order to study them now one of the first photographs ever taken Uh, is being shown here is by uh, Joseph Nicephore Nipse in 1826 in France and how this photograph was taken is quite an interesting aspect there is something called camera obscura or a very dark room or called darkened room and onto the wall you put a very small hole so let me use uh, the pen to draw what i am trying to narrate here so let us imagine that you create a very dark room and then you put a very small hole in the room yeah and then inside the room you put uh, something called bitumen of judea which is a dark material on the walls of this room so you continue to put uh, you know this photoactive material and imagine that you know the light falls through this hole and passes through reaches to hit bitumen of judea at that time this was a material that will have some sort of color differences when light falls on to it and those region where light falls will have a different color because of the photo exposure otherwise it remains the same color now imagine a situation that you had a building which looks like a tower and light falls on to this particular tower and it gets reflected and falls on to the wall where bitumen is coated and accordingly you will have difference in contrast in the places where photons will fall and where do photons fall from from the reflected light that you will have which is falling on to the room of course there will be direct light also falling but that is something that is uniformly falling in the room but what falls from reflection is characteristic of the object that we are studying and this will not work to get a photograph in a day or two but instead it will take long time so therefore people kept this exposure of this room that is having bitumen of judea for quite long time meaning that you know it is for several days in order to get the picture generated inside the room and this is how the first photograph was taken and you can imagine how slow that would be in order to take a photograph taking such longer time it was then uh, there was uh, a, a kind of uh, argument and uh, and an interesting aspect that followed between two of the uh, participants of the horse race whether the horses can have all the legs uh, at a given time without touching the ground this was the question that one asked and the other one tried answering and it went into an argument though it ended up having a big solution which is what we call as first real time motion photography so let me see let me show some of the photographs here that was taken in 1878 by edward mybridge and now you can see that there are instances where the horses have all the four legs in the air but there are also instances where one leg 
is touching the ground. The remaining three are in the air. And you can see all other gradients, two touching the ground, three touching the ground, and all the four touching the ground. So the, the debate got clearly resolved by having such photographs where it is established that yes, horses can have all the four legs up in the air at a given instance in time. And this continued in order to have, uh, uh, I'll take a moment. So you can see here that you know this particular photo run them uh, in a in a quite faster speed. You can have a continuous movie that are generated, and this is the one of the uh, first generations of uh, or the idea of time resolved spectroscopy. And this happened in 1877, like really long ago. So you can see that take all the photographs that are shown in the previous slide, run them faster, you get the movie with one millisecond time resolution. So if you remember those older movies, let it be movie of uh, you know, Mahatma Gandhi or uh, you know, movies of those generation or war movies, etc. They usually have a flickering movement, which is because of one millisecond time scale resolution that you have. Yeah, this is yet another topic that was of interest in the Western world, which is called writing cat. I'm sure that many of you know uh, that cat when thrown up, always it will fall down with four legs that are pointed towards the ground. And this was uh, photographed um, or studied by Asian Jules Mare in 1894 to see that, you know, how nicely cat turns around in order to have all the four legs facing downwards and that is what is indicated over here. So this is another event that people start, uh, were interested. A bullet passing through an apple was yet another topic of great interest for the strobe flash photograph photographers uh, developing the concept of strobe flash wherein you know you get the photograph of bullet passing through an apple and uh, captured at that instance where uh, you know, bullet is almost closer towards an apple. And you can see the uh, dynamic picture that is being generated. And this was done by Harold Edgerton in mid 1900s uh, from uh, MIT. And this was all a parallelly developing topic. And that is when uh, Pro Professor Ahmed Zuvail began his career in order to study the photographic or spectroscopic techniques to understand uh, events that happen in ultra short time scales. And uh, you can clearly see what type of events that generally chemists are or physical chemists are interested uh, are uh, electron movements surrounded by the nucleus, which is what we call as atom. Uh, we, we are interested in uh, the protein uh, movements and the peptide fragments that are rotating or vibrating, etc which we study in rotational spectroscopy and vibration spectroscopy, and then move on to have the dynamics of molecules such as water and uh, see like, you know, how they get oriented in, in liquid water and solid water and, and water vapor, etc. So these are always of our interest and the tools that are being used. You can see here that, you know, uh, there are certain things which you can use in order to study our naked eye. And uh, they are like, really long events that, that happen. And then there are certain events which are photographed with camera. There are certain events that are being uh, captured using the technique that I am going to discuss with you now. Why are these interested? Are we interested only in seeing the electron moving around the atom or various other things? So you see here photosynthetic reaction center has got its own charm uh, that uh, to mimic photosynthetic reaction center is a big excitement now that there are many uh, labs in the world working towards to create 
food through artificial photosynthetic process. So to do that one, we need to understand what our uh, photosynthesis is. So how do we monitor all the processes that happen in leaves and then you know uh, in our eye, which is bacteria rhodopsin and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, sorry retina and various other things. Yeah. So um, uh, here you see uh, how do reactions proceed and what are the kinetic rates and this has been studied since uh, eighteen. Uh, uh, 50s, etc., by various scientists. And some of the scientists you would know very well are Van Hoff, Arrhenius, and uh, several other scientists. And the question that they asked at that time how do molecules approach, collide, and exchange energy? And breaking of old and making of new bonds, uh, and how products get isolated? So these, these are some of the fundamental questions that uh, uh, many of the scientists, scientists wanted to ask at that time. So let me show you uh, a, a nice reaction where uh, nitrogen and oxygen combine to form uh, nitrogen oxides. And uh, some of them are brownish colored that, you know, the color intensity itself will tell that, you know, the, this much is the product formed. And this was the reaction that was going in a time scale that you can use your naked eye in order to detect the formation. Therefore, many scientists at that time used this reaction in order to understand reaction rates and kinetics. And uh, um, uh, this is the expression that you see here, which is called empirical expression. I will arrive at that point in a minute or so. Uh, how, did, uh, how did they manage to get an idea about this particular reaction? Uh, or the reaction uh, e equation that is being formulated here. So this is rate and this is temperature. So what was observed is that you reduce the temperature, the rate of the reaction reduces, and you increase the temperature, rate of the reaction increases. Now this is typically a lab experiment that we uh, give for undergraduate programs in, in many places, probably not the nitrogen oxide reaction, but instead it will be ester hydrolysis or, or things like that. Now, um, anything you do in terms of reaction kinetics, this re reaction uh, formalism is still valid and it is quite interesting uh, to see how it developed. So, for example, if you plot K versus T uh, in a graph, you would notice that they don't give any trend. So it will be like, you know, interesting to see like how they arrived at this expression. And it was then several scientists started working on 1 by K versus T, 1 by K versus 1 by T. And finally, to reach at a point where they plotted L and K versus 1 by T, that ended up giving a straight line uh, from which, sorry, it is this way around, straight line from which you can find out, you know, this expression that is being written, which is K is equal to A e raised to minus E A by R T. Many scientists at that time worked on this particular equation until Arrhenius identified this particular equation, which is still something that we are using. You can see Van Hoff, Berthelot, and various other scientists of at that time also worked on it. Eventually, this is the expression that we have accepted worldwide. Now, having said that, Arrhenius got Nobel Prize, not on a topic related to kinetics. He was also good at electrochemistry. So, Arrhenius got Nobel Prize uh, in recognition of the extraordinary services he has rendered to the advancement of chemistry by his electrolytic theory of dissociation. This clearly shows the vast expanse of the scientists at that time, the versatility that they had in order to work on multiple topics. Yet all of them were important and interesting that we still today use them. There were theoretical approaches uh, by Heitler, London, and Eyring and Polanyi to explain how atoms will come close to each other. So you know the typical uh, harmonic potential versus an harmonic potential-like behavior to explain two atoms coming close to each other. So from infinite distance apart, if two atoms are coming close to each other, initially they will fall uh, in a potential uh, well minimum where the interaction is 
quite effective to keep them stable between the atoms. But then if you bring them further close to each other, repulsion starts operating and you will get to see that it is an unstable situation that two atoms will not uh, reside unless you put huge energy in that particular state. And this is theoretically explained quite long ago in 1927. However, the trajectory using experimental methods uh, were still missing at that time. And the scientists always wanted to study uh, such kind of trajectories, not only in H plus H, but if you take H2 plus H giving H3, this has been, that has been theoretically studied by Eyring and Polanyi in 1931 and afterwards as well. Until 1967, scientists did not have too many experimental support to explain what happens after the uh, two atoms collide with each other or you start with a bond and then you illuminate with energy whether they will dissociate and in the process what will happen. And these three gentlemen here got Nobel Prize in 1967, Manfred Eigen, a theoretician, Ronald George Ryford Norrish, uh, we all know uh, Norrish from Norrish type uh, photochemical reactions, uh, who is an organic chemist and then George Potter, who was a physical chemist slash physicist who developed the fast uh, 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 camera or fast spectrometer in order to study the reactions that occur in ultrafast time scale. Now, let me move forward with a, a quote from the uh, lecture that was given by um, Manfred Eigen. Uh, the title was Immeasurably Fast Reactions. When he got the Nobel Prize, this was the title of his lecture. And there was a subtitle where Prejudice and Pride was the subtitle. And I'm sure that many of you would understand that it is Jane Austen's book, which is Pride and Prejudice Inverted, to show prejudice and pride. And there is a reason why he labels the title of the talk like this. So you can read the first paragraph of his lecture. The rate of true neutralization reactions has proved to be immeasurably fast. I found this quotation in Eucken's Leher book, Der Chemischen Physik. While I was preparing for my doctor's examination, although as a student of Eugen, this book was for me the Bible of physical chemistry. I was then at the age when one accepts practically nothing unquestioned. So I started to reflect on just how fast and immeasurably fast reaction might be. And this led to the finding that eventually uh, recognized him with Nobel Prize meaning that he went on to study, um, you mix NaOH and HCl, uh, the rate at which two of these react together in order to give the products has been studied by uh, these three uh, uh, Nobel laureates. And also uh, they have contributed much more uh, in terms of the topic uh, that, that evolved later. So here you see in 1960s, Theodore Maiman developed the lasers. Uh, this is called four-level laser system. And I'm sure that uh, you know uh, what is a four-level laser system, wherein you typically pump uh, your ions present in the sample to an excited state and keep pumping them enough that you get large number of excited state generated and then allow them to decay to the ground state all at once so that you have large number of uh, excited state uh, atoms or molecules coming all at once to the ground state, therefore creating the lasers. This is the simplified explanation of laser. However, uh, one can uh, uh, go on to lecture for a few hours about lasers by itself. That is not the important part of the top, uh, discussion today. And you can see how nanosecond flash photolysis evolved. It is nothing but you know, a very simple extension of UV visible spectrometer. So let me explain what is UV visible spectrometer first. So you have got a lamp, which can be uh, a lamp, which is either tungsten lamp or deuterium lamp or combined with both to excite samples from 200 to 800 nanometers. Now this being uh, a, a source you can now imagine that you know you put a sample in between and then you put a detector. And whatever radiation, 
that pass through the sample will have lesser intensity while falling onto the detector if the photons are absorbed by the sample that is present in between. Now you can do another trick, use a laser which is kept orthogonally like this in order to have your sample excited. So the sample now goes from ground state to the excited state. So first laser would take the molecule from ground to the excited state, which is what this one does. Now, in the second process, you would notice that your source will pass through the excited state of the sample and then hits the detector. So from here, the molecule further will get excited and that will be characteristic of the excited state thus generated. And now you see this T-shaped configuration allowed excitation of the sample to go to the excited state. And then you probe the sample in the usual UV visible configuration. And this particular step is called pump. And this step is called probe. And as a result, this is called pump probe spectroscopy. It is very simple in terms of understanding that it is almost a UV visible spectrometer, but the light that you shine here will excite the molecule to the excited state. So what we get now information is about the excited state and not about the ground state. Yeah, so for this particular topic, um, Ahmed Zuvail was awarded Nobel Prize for his studies of the transition states of chemical reactions using femtosecond spectroscopy in 1999. Now, this is quite an interesting and exciting topic that could solve the question that I started out with, which is whether two ethylene molecules upon photoillumination goes to the product formation in a direct step or does it create intermediates? And this was studied by Ahmed Zuvail and also various other people. And uh, Professor Ahmed Zuvail succeeded in getting the signals that are corresponding to intermediates that look like this. I have to caution you here that the diradical intermediate that is shown over here is not being captured yet using the uh, ultrafast spectrometer that is generated. However, this has been identified clearly using the method that was developed by uh, Professor Ahmed Zuvail. And these are the signals that correspond to it. Possibly that is little too much to ask for to analyze them in this given one hour. But you can take for granted that these are the signals that are being detected. And therefore, the intermediate has been identified, which is called diradical intermediate. And if you throw carbon monoxide into the mixture, you would also notice that there will be a new product that is generated where carbon monoxide gets inter inserted between the diradical that is generated. So uh, this also confirms that through this path is where the reaction is progressing. And these were seminal contributions in early 90s that made this particular tool uh, uh, important for various other techniques. And this uh, particular work which was published by uh, Emma Zuvail appeared as a front cover in science, as you see here, that the intermediate has been captured and he also eventually got Nobel Prize. Now, I can move on to talk about various other areas where this is particularly important, such as photo excitation of sodium iodide. And you see the kind of oscillations that, that are there uh, while sodium iodide changes to sodium and iodine, studied using laser pulses. And uh, I, I will just move forward because of the want of the time that I will skip, uh, you know, some of the aspects in order to get to a point, uh, you know, what is so important studying them. Yeah. Now, this is one particular uh, uh, slide that I wish to spend a couple of minutes so you can see how it works. So you have probe light and uh, the pump light both will fall onto the sample with a little uh, difference in time of the uh, incidence. So you can imagine now pump is the light that goes and excites the sample. So you can see this is the path with which pump goes and falls onto the sample. 
the molecule is now in the excited state. Now the excited state molecule, you wish to probe, let us say that, you know, that also comes in the straight line as it does in the case of pump and falls onto the molecule. There is absolutely no delay between the pump and the probe. So before the molecule went to the excited state, we tried taking photograph using the probe. So therefore you would not get any important information. But then uh, the, the, the people who worked on optics came up with an interesting idea that you keep a prism, which is a beam deflector that comes onto the uh, uh, beam deflector and deflects and then goes back into the same path and gets into the sample. Now that you see the beam has traveled a little longer, light has a property that if it travels one micron distance more, it comes to the spot or the destination with a delay of 3.3 femtoseconds. It is nothing but is the velocity of light that is being converted here. So you can see that light covers three point, sorry, one micron uh, in 3.3 femtoseconds. So therefore, uh, if you keep beam deflector at one micron distance, you would notice that the, the second light comes onto the sample with one 3.3 uh, femtosecond delay. Now, what is the trick here? You capture uh, the information using the detector, you get certain absorption, and you move the beam deflector about one more micron away from the original distance. So what will happen now? You will get the signal, which is 6.6 .6 femtoseconds after the photo excitation. Now, can we do the same thing by keeping the beam deflector at one more micron distance away? And you keep doing this, you will start getting the absorption of, uh, of the sample at different instants in time. Meaning that after photo excitation, what happens to the sample? And this is nicely shown in a representative uh, spectral evolution here. You see that the reactants are decaying and the intermediates are growing. And you can see in some cases the products are forming, etc. So very clearly at a very short time scale, you would notice that the reactants are disappearing. The products are forming, intermediates are forming and disappearing. And therefore, you get very clear picture about the reaction mechanisms that are uh, that are operating in uh, in many of the organic systems. Now, typically, the facility looks like this, which is called a femtosecond spectrometer. Um, and this is how the uh, the diagram showing the uh, placing of optical mirrors and the deflectors are shown. Little too much of details, but then I thought like, you know, it will be useful for you just to see that. This is a nice video that I have recently seen from Jiang group. Uh, I will try playing them. Uh, yeah, you see uh, the pump laser is falling onto the sample. So this is the sample here. And with little delay, you see that the probe laser is coming, taking longer uh, path and finally coming onto the sample. And by doing so, you keep getting uh, the signal developed over time. So I will rerun this. You can see here the spectral feature uh, that shows that you can have the spectrum generated the moment the sample uh, is hit by the probe light. And once you get that one, you will keep seeing how the signals are formed. And then this is the time trace that once the signal is formed, how do they uh, vanish over a period of time? So this will give the kinetics of what is happening with respect to each species. And this will give the spectral feature of what is the species that is formed, whether it is a diradical or different things that we have discussed here. Now applications are quite large for these kind of uh, spectroscopic techniques. You may imagine like what are the importance. I mean, lasers by themselves are used for various aspects, but then now the spectroscopy is expanding to uh, give a lot of information that uh, scientists did not know in the past. Uh, one such 
example or two such example that I'm going to discuss in another two to three minutes. Well, one is from Asit Sankar, uh, who was the Nobel laureate uh, for biology about a few years ago, uh, who has studied about uh, thymine dimer, which is present in our body, where two thymine molecules through two plus two cycloaddition forms a compound that looks like this. And if you supply photolease, which is an enzyme, it will open these two thymines to get the uh, original thymines back. And this is what is needed uh, in order to avoid the mutation that, that can happen in the DNA. And here you can see a molecular dynamic simulation of what is happening when light falls onto two thymines. So you keep watching them. Uh, you can see that there are two thymines here. And these are the area where two double bonds are present. So the light falls onto the molecule, it gets excited. You can see the time scale, and then you see the cyclobutane formation. It is very similar to the two plus two uh, cycloaddition that you would see in two ethylene molecules. And then once such type of cyclobutane is formed, these are reversible reaction uh, by various means. You can see that both the thymines get back to the original thymines. Now imagine a situation that the rate of formation of cyclobutane dimer in thymine is much more than the rate of disappearance of cyclobutane dimer. Then there is an onset of melanoma cancer that can happen. But if these are at the same rate, it gets repaired and then the biological system moves on. It has got huge lot of implication in terms of understanding photosynthetic reaction center. So you can see two of the chromophores that are sitting on top of each other, create a hole and electron, which is nothing but an absence of an electron and an electron. And that electron jumps from one chromophoric unit to the other, to the other, to the other, until you get electron at this particular chromophore and hole at this electron. And the oxidation happens at this center and the reduction happens at this center and therefore converting carbon dioxide plus water to sugars in order to uh, produce food. And therefore now we have a very good understanding about natural photosynthetic reaction center using the technique that I have narrated. It's typically a UV visible spectrometer, but it has additional optics in order to take the molecule to the excited state. There are many more interesting applications. I would not narrate all of them. It is used for femtosecond laser ablation, uh, femtosecond uh, laser surgery of cornea, uh, femtosecond lasers for micro machining and getting very small orifices and surfaces generated. And people try to understand the movement of water molecules surrounded by protein and DNA, which is called uh, biological water. And ultrafast conversion of ozone to oxygen, which happens in uh, the ozone layer and the reversible reaction, which leads to uh, the depletion of ozone is what you call as ozone hole. All of that can be understood using the camera that I have discussed today. Now, before ending, I, I would just take you to uh, the null exciton part that if you are bringing two of the organic molecules close to each other, in a manner that they do not influence with each other. There are lots of exciting properties that are happening in the excited states. And we study some of them uh, using the, uh, the tool that I have discussed with you today. And that is where the Greek cross uh, arrangement is. So this is the arrangement of two magnesium porphyrin porphyrinoid in, in the uh, photosynthetic reaction center. And they have a tendency to sit on top of each other with an orbital overlap indicated. And this does the electron hole creation in the first place when photon is received. Likewise, we started working on artificial systems that can be made in our group where two of the same chromophore that sit on top of each other in a crossed format that looks like this. And upon photo excitation, can they create char separated state? And what we found indeed is that it is capable of creating a char separated state, which is hole and electron in two of the chromophores that survive for longer time. And these are the signals that will explain what we study in order to understand them. 
However, charges thus created survive for really long uh, time that it has not been seen before, even in the uh, natural photosynthetic reaction center. And this explains like why it is important to have Greek cross arrangement uh, to create long-lived charge separated state. And uh, the, the finding that we have is supported with the uh, solvent, which is polar solvent like acetonitrile. However, a uh, little bit also is seen in THF solvent, but not in solvents like toluene. And uh, with that, I will get to the last uh, uh, minute of my lecture, which is yet another video by Ahmed Zuvain. I'm a, I'm a great fan of Ahmed Zuvain, and you can see that he came up with a four-dimensional technology or 4D microscopy, which is narrated over here. So you can see in this particular video, it narrates about you know three Cartesian coordinates and then the time as fourth uh, uh, dimension uh, in order to get uh, an imaging done in four dimensions. And therefore, right now we are capable of taking fast moving cells, uh, movies, uh, in order to study them and understand the dynamics and function of such cells, which is an emerging topic by itself. And these are uh, some of the group members who study related things in our group and uh, uh, generous funding support from different funding agencies in the country. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And you have my email ID and also the phone number in case if you have any clarification, if you want any clarification at the later stage. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir, for the wealth of knowledge you uh, have provided us. Participants, if you have any queries, you can clear with Professor Mahesh Hariyaran, sir. Please unmute yourself. You can ask the questions, okay? Hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hello, uh, Mahesh. Ashley here. So I have doubt like, how do we keep the sample? Is it is normal cuet or? Uh, yeah. So something? there are, uh, uh, you know, different types of sample holders, but the configuration that we have, uh, which allows the sample to transmit through. So it is in the cuet holder, but then the, trans the light has to transmit through. The same measurement can be done in a trans uh, reflection mode as well, which is much more challenging. And in terms of the signal, it becomes really uh, difficult to capture them in the detector. In those cases, one can use the sample uh, in solid state as well. But in general, it is a cuvette, the same or similar cuvette that you would find in the UV visible spectrometer. There are variants to it. If the sample degrades, for example, the laser intensity used is like really high, then it has a tendency to degrade the sample. In such cases, like you can have a flow cell, which means that you keep supplying new sample all the time when you are photo exciting the sample. In such cases, you would require enormous amount of sample to do the measurements. But then you can also do it in a, another way that you can rotate the sample so that every pulse will fall onto a new sample in a new molecule within the sample itself. Uh, so there are different varieties uh, with which it comes. And you have talked about some surgery, right? That uh, uh, yeah, laser the, surgery. The, so yeah. in that case, how, how does it work? It's like lasers are dangerous. Yeah, and not, not really. I mean, you know, if they are carefully used, uh, so these are all spatiotemporal processes, which means that in precise position, if it falls, for designated amount of time, it can be useful in order to just remove unwanted things either in our body or also in 
in the materials. But then if you overly expose them without having any control, that is when it becomes dangerous. So right now there are machinized robotics that are available in order to give photons with exact number of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, instances that it will hit the uh, destination and uh, by which like you know there are lots of surgical processes are being like and they are fairly safe okay thank you participants any other questions Since uh, there are no more questions, I request Harish to conclude the session and propose a word of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. It is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry and behalf of the Ramaya College of Arts, Science and Commerce. I want to thank the distinguished speaker, Professor Mahesh Hariyaran, sir, for accepting our invitation and sparing time for us. Thank you, sir for your very thought provoking presentation and making this session interesting and meaningful by providing valuable information. I would like to thank, I, I would like to take this opportunity to place and record our heartly thanks to the management of Gokula Education Foundation for their continuous support and financial aid. So I would like to thank the principal, Dr. A. Nagratna ma'am and HODF, our department, uh, and there's uh, for their support and encouragement. I'd like to thank coordinator Dr. Ashley Ma'am for a uh, good initiative to conduct the FTP with eminent scientists. I would like to thank all the participants who have attended this program and made this session a very memorable one. Uh, last but not the least, I thank all the staff members for their co cooperation for extending their support. Once again, I thank you all. Thank you, Mahesh, for accepting the uh, invitation and joining the session. Thank uh, you. Thanks a lot. And uh, hope this was useful. Like, really... Yes, it's a, it was very interesting. And you, you know, you were like a teacher, like teaching as a small students. That's very interesting. Nice. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, Harish, for uh, uh, moderating the session. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you, ma'am. So tomorrow we will meet at 11 o'clock with a new session. Thank you all. I'm ending the meet. Bye.